I think uh, we'll begin now, Professor Dube. Is that fine? Yeah, I think so. It's already five minutes past when yeah. we're supposed to start. Yeah, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the Be Waste Wise webinar uh, content uh, creator, builder, you can say. And as most of you all know that Be Waste Wise is a non-profit organization and we are working towards the principles of uh, dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for uh, knowledge dissemination on waste management since 2013. It gives me immense pleasure to uh, share with you that we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. And uh, we are very happy and proud to announce that we are uh, celebrating a decade of uh, bridging uh, the waste solutions expertise gap worldwide. We started off with one moderator in 2013, and now we have almost uh, 12 moderators who are right now posing questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations that are more uh, relevant to us than those in any other online and offline platform. Uh, we have currently more than 300 contributors as well who have taken part in this journey. We also want to draw your attention to our uh, fundraising campaign that we are currently running for this year. If you see the value in making these diverse sustainability dialogues available free of charge to anyone and everyone right now, what we are currently doing for a monthly basis, we are uh, conducting two webinars uh, on uh, such critical issues uh, worldwide. Uh, we would request you to please support us in this mission. I encourage you all to do check out our recently revamped website and donate. We also uh, share uh, the link of the fundraising campaign over the chat function. Now, moving on to the discussion today, we have our very eminent and learned moderator, Professor Dube. Professor Brijesh Dube has been moderating our webinars for uh, many years together now. And uh, he is uh, an environmental engineer, educator, researcher, trainer, and consultant in the area of circular engineering, environmental engineering services, and health, presently at IIT Kharagpur. Uh, Dr. Dubey has worked with uh, several government agencies in many countries uh, on various environmental projects and has authored and co-authored more than 250 publications in this area and has presented at several national and international conferences as well. Today, Professor Dubey is going to draw our attention on how to manage world's most littered item cigarette butts. I can see a lot of people already commenting on the comment section about this particular uh, risk, environmental risk that this uh, uh, this issue has been, uh, you know, causing and posed by uh, the cigarette butt littering. And we today with this discussion, we will try and explore economically and environmentally sustainable technologies for repurposing as well. On our panel today, we have uh, to discuss this uh, issue is uh, Naman Gupta, who is the founder and director at code efforts, uh, which manufactures affordable, handcrafted, and sustainable paper and fiber merchandise using recycled cigarette butts for global market. We have, on other hand, uh, Dr. Hari Bhakt Sharma, who's currently as an uh, assistant professor of environmental engineering at Sikkim Manipal Institute of Technology in Sikkim. And he, uh, most importantly, is a lead author on the cigarette waste paper recently published. Uh, we are uh, also happy to have Divya Tiwari, who is the principal scientist and advisor at SAHAS. Divya has joined SAHAS in 2014 as the CEO, and today she as a supply chain consultant. Uh, you know, prior to that, she was a supply chain consultant and SME for more more than 15 years, having worked across industrial life sciences, environment, IT, and hospitality and FMCG sectors. Uh, before uh, we proceed forward, forward to this discussion, we request you all to know that uh, this particular webinar is being recorded and we will be uploading this on our website and YouTube channel. We request everybody to use the Q&A section for your questions to the panel. And uh, we are happy that you can use the webinar chat function to introduce yourself, where you're from, and if you have any comments or any uh, you know, points or valid uh, discussion points that you want to raise with the panel, you can definitely use the chat function for that. So uh, back to the topic to, and to our learned uh, panel, over to you, Professor Dupe. Thank you. Thank you, Akansha, for uh, getting us started. Uh, so as Akansha mentioned, so we have three esteemed panelists who have been working on this particular topic and related topic of waste management for quite some time. Uh, so, and so, and then uh, as Akansha also said that uh, please feel free to put your question and answer uh, on the Q&A. 
And if you have any general comments to make and general suggestions, you can put it on chat as well. And do introduce yourself on the chat. I do see we have people from many continents, actually, if you look at the chat, to many continents, people are coming. That's really good to see the interest on this particular topic. So without further delay, the way we will go is in the initial part, uh, we will have the three esteemed panelists uh, share their uh, views uh, on this particular topic one by one. And then we will spend a good amount of time, nearly 50% of the time, focusing on taking question and answers from the audience. So feel free to put your question and answer. That's what we really enjoy the most. Uh, to answering your question, answering your queries, and in fact, learn from uh, that because uh, see, we all are learners. We all are learning this uh, uh, this area of waste management, or specifically, say, cigarette birds and all that. So, without any further taking the time, we'll uh, jump to uh, the first panelist uh, who will take the stage, uh, Dr. Hari Bhakt Sarma. So, uh, Dr. Hari, uh, please go ahead and share your views. And again, as I said earlier, please try to be within ten minutes. Your slide went away. Uh, it was there for a minute, but uh, yeah. Uh, is it now on? Yes, it is there. Am I audible? You are. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening from India. Uh, and uh, I'm Dr. Hari, an assistant professor of uh, civil and environmental engineering at Sikkim Manipal Institute of Technology. And uh, uh, thank you, Akansa, for introducing introduction and uh, the best white for producing and uh, giving this you know immense opportunity to present our recent findings from our work. So we are dealing with the cigarette bud the, as far as the National Geographic data, it is the world most littered item. So how does that cigarette bud generate it? Obviously from cigarette consumption, right? So the data given by the World Bank and the National Geographic says that although the consumption of cigarette has recently declined that is mostly in the developing country it was around 6 trillion in 2012 it has come down to 5 trillion but the demand for the cigarette consumption has sustained in develop, developing nations of asia and africa and one of the problem also a solution they thought but the problem is that 90 percent of the cigarette buds contain the filtered material that we generally use cigarette filter that we have said as a cigarette bud that we generally say as a cigarette bud. Now, since we consume this cigarette very, very globally, every country has their own demand of cigarette production and consumptions. The amount of cigarette consumed go globally would be an almost an equivalent of the cigarette bud literally happening around the world, right? So that cigarette bud, we have to understand what is that cigarette bud that we are dealing with. So cigarette bud. Whether it is fully consumed or you know partially consumed, it is dissected and you know presented in front of you. Cigarette as such, tobacco is wrapped in the paper and it has a cigarette filter at the bottom. You know that cigarette filter you know filters the particulate smoke by particle retention method, generally filtration method. And that's since you are puffing the cigarette, a lot of tars and nicotines and heavy metals and a lot of carcinogens are retained on that filter matter. Just imagine that heavy metals and carcinogens, all those chemicals, you are just, just tossing, tossing into the environment without, you know, properly disposing. We don't have a facility for that. We are just disposing it, right? Then the problem is, what is wrong with the filter material? Cigarette, but that we generally say with cigarette filter, what is that? The wrapping that is cellulose, but the filter material that we have inside is a cellulose acetate, which is nothing but an engineered bioplastic. Now, since it's a bioplastic, you may say this is a wonder material. This is not plastic. It is not very simple as that. The study shows that even the bioplastic like cellulose acetate in a lab environment, if it's incubated for the combust com composting, for a five-year period, they were able to retain their mass of around you know 30 to 50 percent that means in five years also they are not getting degraded complete, completely that means it is not compostable obviously it may be a biodegradable for a long run but it is not compostable in short run with all the chemicals in it it is not biodegradable it is there in the environment right so with that you know cigarette bud 
is the world most littered item around 6.5 trillion trillion that is around 18 billion a year you see around the global coast you know around the rivers and beaches it is closely near to the food wrappers as far as this ocean conservancy study is concerned but some of the part of the world it is the most littered item especially in the european region 40 percent of the litter item collected is cigarette but next is a plastic pieces which is around 20%. That means almost double is a cigarette butt that we see around in the global coasts. And then what is the problem with cigarette butt? It is you are tossing, you are tossing it anywhere, you are throwing it anywhere, there is no collection happening, it is everywhere. That means the studies have shown that this cigarette butt with all the chemical in it uh, hinders the growth and germination of certain plant species. It also impacts the behavior of freshwater invertebrates if it's in the water system. That means the chemical in its leaches, and that leachage, leachage with all those chemicals, you know, impacts the survival and behavior of freshwater invertebrates. Another problem is that cigarette butt is wrapped in the filter paper, as you know, in simple filter, filter paper. Now, when this in the environment, as soon as it gets contact with the water and all, that the outside cover will get exposed easily. And the whatever is inside, that is cellulose acetate-based filter, start degrading naturally, right, over the time. Now here, the degradation doesn't mean decomposition, deterioration. The deterioration can be due to physical, you know, aberration, you know, sunlight activity or the erosion. And it starts breaking down to a microfibers. And this microfibers is what another problem is coming up. It's a microplastics, bio-microplastics. That is what it is coming. Now, this bio-microplastics, when it goes to a water Dr. system... Dr. Sarma? Yes. Yeah, there is a some uh, voice, uh, like your voice is a bit, uh, there's some noise in there. Can you just try to fix that? Quality is a bit uh, on the lower side. Yeah, and I'm audible now. You are audible, but there is always some, uh, as if something is moving behind you or something. Could be your uh, mic and uh, headphone issue. Uh, I just, just give me a two. Yeah, now? Yeah, slightly better. Okay, I think that's the issue of the fan that I was with. Uh, okay. so, right. Yeah, so this microplastics after deterioration's attracts uh, pollutants in its surface. And since you have puffed the cigarette, that means a lot of tars and carcinogen is in it. When it reaches to a water system, uh, these are, you know, the pretentious food for some of the, you know, zooplanktons and other things. Now, since zooplanktons plankatons consumes this, uh, heavy metal laden uh, microplastics that is generated from cigarette butt that reaches to a food chain. Over a food chain, it biomagnifies. That is what biomagnification. And indirectly, it is reaching to our plate. As such, you are not you are consuming the bioplastic, but along with you are consuming the micro uh, you know the micro pollutants and other heavy metals along with it. That is one of the problems. Since it also deteriorates due to the different fragmentations process or photodegradation, it contributes largely to the microplastic, which is a new emerging thread worldwide. And this microplastic acts as a vector. It carries the micro microorganisms and it carries the you know, heavy metals along with it. So overall in the environment, you are littering everywhere in the street corners, in the beaches and in the you know, other area that somewhere around either through the food chain, agriculture system, the waterway, river, it is interacting with the environment, with us human environment very closely. It is reaching to us in one way or other, either through the water we drink, either through the, either through the food we consume, either through the you know, water bodies, groundwater contaminations, it is reaching us. So tossing the you know, puffed cigarette into the environment, cigarette butt into the environment, you are not getting rid with the problem. You are actually inviting a problem in other way. So understanding the issues of cigarette butt littering becomes very crucial. And this, the problem is upstream issues and downstream issues. The upstream issues is smoking has become very common. You know, we cannot just deal with the cigarette butt. Then cigarette butt, you know, littering happens because you consume cigarette. So smoking has become very common. Filter bird is made of a cellulose acetate. It's not a biocompostable. It's a very small size, 
you know, it is spatially distributed, littering habits, lack of environmental stewardship, that is very less in, that is the upstream issues. Now, when it is generated, you know, when it is littered, that those are downstream issues. Collection challenges is one of the problem because it is a very minute, it is a small, and it is spatially dis distributed. It's a widespread littering, problem of biodegradability, it doesn't degrade in the environment very easily. This result that I've shown you earlier, it shows in the five years also, around 30 to 50% of weight is still persistent. It is not compostable. Then all the leaching of the chemicals contributes to the lot of environmental consequences in the freshwater ecosystem and into the soil. It gets mixed with the regular waste. You know, it, one of the EPA standards does uh, says that it, it comes under the hazardous waste, but there is no regulation for that. And recycling becomes challenges because you are not able to collect the waste to that volume, then recycling becomes challenges. So some of the upstream intervention, maybe innovation in cigarette bud, cigarette bud design itself. First innovation would be obviously discourage the smoking. And then, then another can be, can we solve the problem of biodegradability? There are some issues where they have introduced some chemicals and additives and catalysts to improve the rate of degradation. They, like titanium dioxide and other things are used. And they have tried with the alternative of cellulose acetate, maybe starch-based food, starch-based solutions. Because we are smoking, you know, we consume, people generally consume cigarette, but in like two minutes, one minute, that means you don't need very, you know, resistance uh, fibers, uh, you know, polymers. Food starch-based can also work, but then economics comes there. Or maybe some you know introduction of reusable filters. Maybe you can hang on with your you know keychain and all those things with no filters. But whenever you want to smoke, you can use that filters and you can reuse again and again. Activated charcoal based something like that. Can we do that? Is one of the equations that we have asked in our research as well. Downstream because I said downstream is a collection problem. So can we use some intervention in colleges, in university outside, in canteens, and all those things? You know, young people smoking. We we have to discourage them from smoking. But then, what do we do with the waste? They are littering. So can we do some innovations of asking questions and you know you know something competition based you know some activities so that the waste at the end is collected in some innovative way? Can we do that? If we have collected the waste from this, you know, activities through different, you know, incentives and other approach, what do we do with the rest? Can we valorize that? Can we do recycling? There are some studies they says that you can use in the as a constructing material, but that is mostly a filler material. Uh, you can valorize some of there are techniques like pyrolysis and hydrothermal carbonization process to valorize into the carbon material. You know, it's a plastics, bioplastics, you know, plant-based plastics. So you can generally, uh, you know, valorize into the carbon material. You can also, you know, convert into pellets and try to recycle it back or to make other product, you know, in valorizing some other product. Can we do that? So these are the questions and some of the research that we have put forward uh, from our recent, uh, you know, investigations in the research paper. Based on that, we have overall recommended policies and we have divided that policy in price-based policy, right-based instrument, regulations and behavioral instrument. This four category we have divided. Price-based mostly include incentive through tax-based, increased price, deposit refund, incentives. You know, those things uh, are, are meant to discourage, not only discourage the smoking, but also incentivize the uh, you know, the remediation actions are called cleanup actions, right based, mostly EPR based extended producer, shifting the, uh, you know, shifting the, uh, you know, blame from the consumer to the producer. That is what the EPR is. Uh, and deposit refund that would help in collections. You can deposit and get some, you know, incentives of that. Can we do that? We have elaborately discussed in our papers. A regulation, obviously, that is being followed. Bans and monitoring, you know, setting standard, you know, like these days we see smoking rooms where the you are not allowed to smoke outside and you have a ded dedicated place for smoking and that promotes you know that promotes the collections of cigarettes but at the same time you are secluded from certain mass indirectly behaviorally you are discouraging you are discouraging yourself from smoking a uh, behavioral some of the nudges that we can insert in our day-to-day -day life through information appeal generally we see that educations can we change you know social nudging but then we have also argued sometimes too much of regulation uh, promotes, uh, you know, coveted smoking. People will hide and smoke, and that will contribute to the, you know, widespread littering. 
you know if you have a dedicated place for smoking you you promote the collections but if you are regulating too much then coverted smoking will promote the littering that is also we have argued in our uh, findings everything that i have discussed right from the cigarette but uh, you know generations to the problem with the toxicity issues to the you know all those things is discussed in our recent uh, publications uh, you can contact me or the professors and it is uh, available there we, we have discussed this thing in very detail with all the recommendations and the you know from cradle to grave what would be the problem globally that is what uh, you know i would like to share uh, from our finding thank you thank you thank you dr sharma for a good overview of the problem uh, so Again, I would encourage uh, our audience to chime in with their views, uh, what's happening in their area of the world, because we see people from around the world who have joined us. And if you have any Q&A uh, questions, please put it on the Q&A uh, side. So now we'll move to say, Hari, like Dr. Sarma has stated that this is the problem. These are things out there. Then uh, uh, Naman Gupta has some solutions to that. So let's look at the solutions part. Like what can we do with this waste? and how we can come up with value-added products. So floor is yours, Naman. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and everyone for joining in for this webinar. Uh, I am Naman Gupta, and I represent my company, Code Effort Private Limited. Uh, we started this company in the year 2018 with just a, a fixed mission to eradicate cigarette buds from our beautiful environment. But... Uh, it was very simple on the paper, but practically when we took it on our shoulders, so the entire scenario was completely different. And uh, while I was seeing the journal of uh, Dr. Hari, so he has very, uh, uh, he has covered everything in detail in terms of scientific and the theoretical part. But I'll take you, I'll take a few minutes to explain you the practical problems. The first practical problem with respect to cigarette buds is not that it is the number one littered single-use plastic. It is, uh, while it is the number one littered single-use plastic, it is also the number one ignored item. Because we as humanity, we have accepted uh, people throwing away cigarette buds on the roadsides and we don't question them or even we don't ask them to use a trash bin. And even if somebody who is an environmentalist or he or she concerns regarding appropriate disposal, then also in countries like India or developing countries, uh, when we started in the year 2018, there were no specific receptacles or the bins to dispose the cigarette buds. So smokers also are concerned with the environment because if they throw the cigarette buds into a normal trash bin, so the entire trash bin can catch fire. So the main problem is the consumer behavior change that we have to develop and consumer behavior change is not a one day task. It takes a lot of time and a lot of efforts and a lot of awareness uh, that needs to be done to bring about the change regarding the problem of cigarette buds. Now, when we started in the year 2018, we developed a 3P model to ensure that the cigarette buds problem is solved to the maximum extent. I'll explain you the 3P model. The first P in our 3P model is to procure because uh, before recycling, we need to procure these materials. So for procurement, that is the first P. Uh, we implemented a lot of strategies. The first one was definitely to provide receptacles to uh, cigarette shop, uh, restaurants, lounges, corporate company where there is a specific smoking zone. And we even try to give the same receptacle to individual smokers so that this was helping us in channelizing the waste and getting the waste segregated at source. So by providing a bin, we solve a lot of problems. First, the consumer behavior change gets uh, uh, developed. Segregation at source happens uh, so that it doesn't get mixed up with the waste. And we are able to get a lot of quantities by placing the bin. So we are basically providing an infrastructure for appropriate disposal of cigarette buds. The second strategy that we implemented was to connect with the rack pickers and municipal corporations. Because why we chose rack pickers and below poverty line people? Because in, in every everywhere, not just in India, all these people know where to get the uh, waste from which they can sell. So 
uh, why uh, why we incentivize these rat pickers and all these municipal people because uh, we are able to empower them we are able to generate more livelihood for them and we are able to get more quantities which we can use as a raw material and as a resource for further processing so this are these are basically the two strategies that we have implemented for the procurement of cigarette buds now coming to the second p of our 3p model that is to process or we can say recycle so in the second p that is to process in cigarette buds like you were seeing the journal there are three components majorly the first one is tobacco so tobacco is a plant and it is a natural uh, natural growing plant and uh, it is biodegradable as well so as per facts and as per its scientific uh, composition it is a very good fertilizer and acts as a pesticide so using this tobacco we are converting it into compost powder which we sell to the nearby gardens and nurseries the chemical and the uh, content of these uh, uh, compost powder is as per the parameters and guidelines which falls under the approved uh, lab certifications the second component that we get is the paper the brown or white paper covering that is uh, over the cigarette filter so this paper is also biodegradable but the ink that has been used so these are harmful and also causes a lot of problem for the ecosystem soil marine and everywhere so from this paper we are making two kinds of products the first product that we invented in the year 2019 if i remember correctly was a mosquito repellent so this mosquito repellent uh, works very well for the domestic and personal use and it is also not even human friendly but also pet friendly so anybody and everybody can use it and it is very easy to make so it doesn't require much technology or no special skills to make these mosquito repellents and you can yourself make this product using our technology now coming to the second uh, second product of the paper so we started making recycled handmade paper out of it i even have a product with me so this is a carry bag that we have made so this carry bag is made using the same recycled paper that we are uh, generating from the uh, cigarette paper so this uh, this is a basically a stationery or a utility utility item because converting cigarette buds into construction items and everything won't give uh, it won't be economically viable we ourselves as a company we have tried and tested it but if you want to scale up the business and if you are planning to do a venture where you are planning to manage and recycle cigarette buds into products so it is very essential to look for the economics and sustainability of the business also so that is why we came up with the handmade paper products which is a we can say a low hanging fruit and which sells very easily into the market so this same handmade paper we are using it to make uh, envelopes uh, carry bags diaries we even make calendars out of it so uh, the the opportunities are endless and the utilization of the handmade paper is endless now another feature that we have added to this paper is that we have added seeds to it plantable seeds so instead of throwing it away after use you just have to tear it into small pieces and put it in a pot so that after 15 to 20 days a new plant will germinate so that you are not just solving the problem of waste but you are also providing plantation and you are adding more value to the environment okay now the coming to the third component of the cigarette buds that is the main problem that is uh, been covered by dr hari is the uh, polymer material the uh, uh, the fibers which we call cellulose acetate so this cellulose acetate has a lot of uh, physical and chemical properties and it has been widely used before 1970 cigarettes didn't have any filters after this invention of cigarette filters came in 1960 late 1960s 70s and it was added as a promotional tool tool by i guess philip morris so after after some time they realized that the cigarette filter is actually solving a lot of problem uh, with respect to the consumption rate of the uh, cigarettes and giving a good feel to the smokers so this was made mandatory after seeing the uh, be benefits of these filters so that is how the cigarette filters came into picture as a whole so to recycle the cigarette filters we have developed an in house technology it's a completely automated 
uh, is able to ensure that almost 99.9 percent .9 of the fibers that we have is getting recycled and getting used into further products so after recycling these uh, fibers we are able to make a bunch of products such as uh, we are making home decor items we are using this fiber as a stuffing inside cushions uh, toys uh, like i can show you a toy also so this is a toy that we have this is a watermelon this is this has been hand stitched uh, so inside this toy we have stuffed the fibers so that it gives a very soft feel and it can be used as a as a showpiece or as a gift item for the uh, people the other item that we have made from the fibers is a yarn yarn or we can say a thread i'll also show that so this is the thread that we have made so this thread is usable to make fabrics or textiles we can say so this is a very good product and it can be widely used and explored in all kinds of products and because these fibers are a bit coarse than the normal cotton and nylon they are not very soft so it is very good for the winter wear and for insulation purposes so this is another utilization of the fibers and most recently we came up with another uh, paper made from the same fibers which we call cotton uh, cotton paper or we can say tree free paper so this paper is printable using your own domestic uh, printer if you have a printer instead of buying a4 sheets from the market you can use this paper and print anything and everything on that and we are making stationery out of it so this was the second p which in which i already covered the third p that is to produce so i'll i'll summarize the th three p process the first is to procure second is to process and the third is to produce so by uh, implementing this three p process we are able to provide an end to end solution and foster circular economy and we are able to contribute towards the society within these five years we have been able to recycle more than 2.5 billion cigarette butts so far and it, we have just started so we still have a long way to go uh, would love to hear from you and uh, in case uh, anybody has questions uh, to which i can add value and uh, probably help uh, very happy to help thank you thank you for your patient listening thank you thank you naman for uh, yeah there are a few questions already out there which we'll take after we hear from, from dr tiwari so uh, dr tiwari the floor is yours so if you can set light on how uh, uh, in terms of the collection part and other logistics and but with, with your experience of working in this sector in sahas for so many years uh, how we can deal with this problem how we can deal with this cigarette waste management problem please go ahead yeah thank you so much uh, professor dubey and uh, the team to um, give us this opportunity to share our inputs uh, sahas works uh, uh, in the area of municipal solid waste so we collect waste from uh, homes we collect waste from offices we collect waste from uh, any uh, shops and malls etc and uh, from these locations we we cigarette but there was confusion as to which category it should go in but the rules which have come out last year by cpcb the, it states that the cigarette butt will be going into the dry waste now um, i would like to explain the process little bit how things are happening in india now this is i would say what i'm telling is a more formal process not followed by the entire country it is little more um, sophisticated compared to how rest of the waste is managed a bulk of the waste in the country is collected as mixed waste um, and most of it is going to the landfill the regions where we operate or the localities where we operate we do implement source segregation and india mandates three way segregation so there is biodegradable waste there is non biodegradable recyclable waste and the third category is called domestic hazardous waste so which will have um, broken glass nails uh, leftover medicines uh, all the sanitary waste also the the rules classify in dry waste we ask people to put it in the domestic hazardous waste categories uh but that aside th these are the three categories which the rules mandate and that's what we implement on the ground and i can tell you that uh, this is very challenging uh, uh, you know unfortunately the larger messaging goes about as gila sukha wet and dry and uh, you know two way segregation is still there is some level of acceptance 
four way uh, you know three way is a big challenge and now we if we start introducing more categories at source uh, at domestic household level it is challenging i agree that cigarette butt collection from say a hotel restaurant office where people have a designated place where they smoke hence they can deposit the cigarette butt there is a uh, is a very doable easier uh, and must be done part but what is coming from residents uh, to expect that when it is coming as part of driveways this small item will be sorted and kept aside i can tell you that the cost of sorting this item uh, will be uh, you know it will not be viable it you will not be able to get the kind of return that uh, the effort that will go in sorting this category so what is if we really want to address this as a separate category what is important is dedicated collection i am i don't have data i was trying to read up that how much is it collected from say bulk generating points say offices and malls and restaurants and how much is collected from non bulk generators i i couldn't get a split maybe namad might have an idea but uh, definitely setting up something for bulk generators is a very i would say doable way forward uh, and dedicated bins as naman talked about that uh, if you can have dedicated cigarette bins getting popularized uh, people getting educated on this is what is to be used um, on the streets in tourist spots and you know if if a very very um, i would say typically identifiable bin get standardized for cigarette butt it will help you know if everybody designs their own uh, bins then people are confused you know the people start putting all kinds of stuff in those bins i'm sure naman must be facing that uh, but if it's a very a very standardized bin which is you know every cigarette smoker will see it and can see that this is a cigarette bin that will help coming to one more uh, point which we keep debating internally that whenever we talk about a dedicated stream collection and its recycling uh so recycling value if it if there is an inherent recycling value okay say consider the case of pt bottles uh where you know pt bottles are turned into uh, fiber which is then used to make textiles etc and there is no uh the the fiber which comes out it is not that there is any premium that is built on it that it's a recycled products yes some people do sell it you know they charge some premium but actually bulk of the pt recycling is happening as normal fiber there's no premium going into it and hence uh, pt recycling rates are very high at least in india they are quite high but the moment uh, the inherent value is coming because of the premium in the product that the person is valuing that yes this product is coming from recycled uh, cigarette material and hence the person is paying a premium that market is limited uh, maybe naman can throw more lights on this but what we have seen is because we ourselves sell uh, 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 you know some sheets which are made from uh, recycled uh, paper cartons now those sheets uh, are appreciated and there is a, by a very limited uh, market so there is a very limited market you can't expect that entire paper carton produced in the country uh, used and produced in the country can be absorbed through those sheets it doesn't happen because the market because they are expensive compared to their other uh, competing products uh, hence it is very difficult to scale up these options so if there is there is no inherent uh, natural value of that uh, product it gets marked you know it is more like a luxury uh, product and hence there is a very limited market so in this case two concerns that we have with the cigarette butt recycling one is is there an inherent market and can hence be it be scaled and aman can throw right lights on that second is uh, if i look at the uh, problem with this uh, you know uh, category uh, from whatever little we have read it is the toxicity of the material so there are as per cpcb report itself there are 7000 chemicals in this uh, in e, you know in the cigarette butt uh, when we are making products out of it and they are further getting into the uh, usage state be it paper or other products and when that life ends uh, you know uh, what is the what is the toxicity level in those products 
at the time of usage and when their life ends because we need to consider both when you're talking about circular economy we need to think of what happens to this product at the time of usage and what happens to it at the end of life so whether uh, the current recycling methods are ensuring that all these products are you know they are uh, at and what is what is the cost of that treatment process where you are able to remove heavy metals and various other pollutants which are there in this uh, but so right now whatever we get it goes to cement factories uh, for co processing where it is burnt at very high temperature because it is at 1000 degree centigrade a lot of pollutants are getting managed i won't say heavy metals are getting managed but the ash from cement factories is again subjected to pollution control mechanisms so we are seeing that probably that's a better destination uh, from the angle of toxicity and second if i look at from the angle of volume so the total quantum of cigarette butt produced in the country uh, the data i got from uh, cpcb is 1700 tons annually bangalore produces 4000 tons of waste daily so the quantum is so small that is there a need to you know set up this uh, recycling etc or is it better because there's so much which is anyway you know has to be sent to cement factories because it is non recyclable uh, be it your textiles you know that that number will cross Uh, you know almost 20 30% of the waste that india generates daily which is 65 million tons per day is non recyclable it is going for co processing should we pull out this category uh, is the justification for handling this category separately for recycling is there a environment or business case uh, is is a, is a dilemma which we keep you know when we participate in such discussions is what we face uh being in the waste management sector and seeing the complexity of the logistics with respect to collection and recycling and the whole value system around it so uh, toxicity uh, inherent value potential in the products being made and the quantum of waste does it require a dedicated collection and recycling because when there's so much of non recyclable in any way going to uh, for co processing should we you know set up a separate supply chain are some of the questions and should this problem be rather addressed by like uh, professor hari was saying uh, why not go for biodegradable materials uh, why to go for a system which then again has issues with microplastics etc so so the moment we set up recycling you know some of the industry responsibility which today they will be forced to you know put their r and d effort in coming up with alternative materials you know some of these guys then start pushing it anyway it is you know there is a great recycling solution why do we need to replace it so sometimes recycling acts as a barrier in terms of actually coming up with uh, more environment friendly materials so these are some of our concerns uh, with respect to uh, the recycling approach of uh, cigarette butt i'll end my uh, comments here thank you thank you dr tiwari for your insights uh, onto the issue so we do see uh, uh, from the initial thoughts that you all three shared we have already uh, created interest among the audience so there are several questions out there in the chat as well as the q and a section so i'll we'll go one by one on that so we'll start uh, i'll what i'll do i'll probably combine few questions together as well because there are some some similar questions are there so we'll start with uh, naman uh, uh there are some questions on say if you are making this uh, a compost so are the additives in the tobacco is still active in some way in the compost do you test for it like how do you make sure that it is uh, not there or if it's there in what quantity it is there or what is the level and uh, your recycling process suggests that you need dry unsoiled butts how do you collect them and how do you source the butts and then also the, somebody was talking about that uh, how you get it through the urban local bodies or the municipal waste it is the rag pickers or the waste collectors who how you are sourcing your material and uh, and of course those toxic stuffs that we just talked about yeah go ahead sir i got confused you asked a lot of questions in a single go but uh, coming to the oh. first question regarding the tobacco uh, yes. uh, i'll explain so this tobacco part is uh, any day uh, recyclable and uh, biodegradable so we are using organic uh, uh, bacteria and fungus these are basically microorganisms which you can even buy locally or 
from online stores even offline stores widely acceptable so and even if you want to mix it with other kitchen waste or garden waste so it will give out the similar kind of compost which we are already making we can even use the uh, tobacco in vermi composting or anaerobic uh, composting process there are multiple n number of composting technologies that are available across the uh, across the entire world uh, but tobacco is less than 1% of the total waste that we are getting in terms of cigarette butts so tobacco forms less than 1 or maximum 2% of the total waste that we are getting so it is i can say a very uh, negligible material but as a recycler we cannot throw away that material so that is the reason we are recycling tobacco and making uh, compost out of it and as per certification as and as per its uh, content uh, of the material all the npk value is as per the parameters and well within the guidelines which we are able to uh, provide to the nearby gardens and nurseries which is already providing uh, very good results for growing uh, basic flowers and basic plantation so no problem in tobacco and even if you mix it with water and uh, spray it outside so there are multiple uses for the tobacco as well so in terms of the sourcing of the material question, yeah the sourcing of the material like uh, as uh, dr tiwari was also mentioning in terms of the logistics of the collection say so you need a certain amount to have to make a some product out of that so how you are how you are able to source it like how how is that happening right so i remember uh, 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 her saying about the uh, mass generators bulk generators and individual residential generators so in terms of residential generators these people are already using some kind of an ashtray or something so we basically replace that ashtray with our uh, receptacle it's a portable receptacle which can accommodate close to uh, around 1000 to 1500 cigarette butts so once this bin is full majority of the uh, residents volunteer and send it across to our facility at their own expense uh, just to contribute towards the society instead of throwing it into the normal trash bin that is how this mechanism works with the residents in terms of uh, bulk generators like uh, 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 corporate companies and uh, restaurants lounges hotels there we provide a complete mechanism where we place the bins we arrange uh, logistics and uh, we assign a representative who go there on a weekly or uh, twice a week to uh, create awareness amongst the smokers so that they can dispose their cigarette butts into the bin we sensitize them to uh, understand what the uh, entire campaign is about and uh, the problem of cigarette butts and the utilization of cigarette butts and after this uh, material gets collected we recycle it so these are two mechanisms but as a recycler we need continuous raw materials so to to uh, remove this barrier we have a contract system which we call association in our terms so this association is basically a business model for all the entrepreneurs and uh, a small and medium enterprises wherein by just supplying us the materials we provide them with a monetary return for the uh, amount of waste that they are able to supply us let's say for example if you are based in uh, one part of the country and you want to uh, manage the waste from your society or from your city or your district or even your state and then become our supplier just like a normal trading uh, of uh, raw material happens in any kind of a business in our case also we trade cigarette butts so if you are our supplier whatever material you supply to us we provide you an incentive so that you are able to generate revenues for you you are able to generate livelihoods for other people who are working with you for example rack pickers and your uh, daily staff and also you are able to scale up because the more quantity you supply the rates increase as per the quantities so this is an entire business model that we have created we started in the year 2018 this model of association we launched in the year 2019 initially we started from three cities uh, noida delhi and gurgaon these are well connected three cities right now we have a presence in more than 200 districts out of 700 in india so within 5 years we have been able to uh, uh, create uh, collection centers in almost one third of the nation so if we are able to scale up our business and in the coming time we are able to generate uh, collection centers in all across india 
so the problem of procurement will actually uh, not be a challenge for us because we are into this deeply and we are able uh, we have seen it practically so basically uh, whatever problems that we faced re regarding procurement we have already solved that to convert it into utility items and like uh, divya was mentioning about the uh, recycled products because this market is limited i partially agree to this because the sustainability market is growing and who is growing that we as recyclers and we as upcycle product manufacturers and recyclers are the ones who are promoting this and making these products instead of using uh, conventional items and uh, traditional materials so and the, if you read about the change in the consumer uh, behavior and the consumer acceptance of sustainable market it is growing rapidly people are willing to spend more and even spend uh, towards sustainable items because that actually solves the problem of the environment coming to another question of the end use so in our case the technology that we are using to recycle the fibers we are able to recycle it to the fullest the technology that we have it's well certified we have all the lab certifications to ensure that we are able to remove all the toxins normal normal sulfur nicotine all these things heavy metals like arsenic butane all the chemicals have been removed and the final product that is coming out will, of the material so is when it's, recycled. yeah naman when it's yeah. removed it has to go somewhere isn't it it will not disappear so it has to be either in the liquid waste that you are generating or the solid waste that you are generating so because anything on the periodic table is not going to disappear so arsenic will be there somewhere so like how is it do you do the mass balance like those are again becoming more of a research question <laughs> but uh, uh, well, oh, I will come back I to can that. explain that also. But uh, if I if I have you. to explain I'll, the I'll entire recycling that, process, uh, yeah, yeah that I'll come will back to you on that in a minute. Uh, so, Hari, there are some couple of questions talking about. Uh, you have looked at as part of the review on uh, several toxins present uh, as as part of the cigarette waste. So, have there been research done in terms of uh, the quantification of the toxins from littered cigarette waste? Have you seen research papers along that line? And uh, can we take this cigarette waste and make some briquettes out of that? Uh, because it seems to have a good calorific value. So based, can we make some, say, hydrochar or something like that and make some briquettes? Uh, is, what's your thought on that? You are mute, uh, Hari. Yeah. Uh, there are several studies on the toxicological studies. Mostly they have done the studies on the, what are the impact of nicotine on the environment. Mostly that is what it is, studies focus around. But exact quantification of how much of one cigarette butt, you know, leads is not quantified yet. Uh, because that I think that would vary whether how much of cigarette, what percentage of cigarette you have smoked, that may vary. But if you ask the question whether it is toxic, toxic, toxicological studies has been done, yes, it is done. And they have proven that at certain quantity, at certain rate, for certain time, exposed to an environment, that it is toxic to not only to the marine uh, in body weights, but also to certain plants for the germinations. As far as the briquetting is done, I think uh, that is a very good uh, suggestion. Even when when we say Dr. Tiwari was saying that we can send it to the uh, cement factory. So when you are sending a bulk of waste, that is also a cigarette butt, but which is fluffy. That means voluminous. So we can convert that to a briquette. That means less volume, less transportation cost. And uh, when we do the briquetting, we have seen certain percentage change in calorific value. But then if you added some technology to valorize it say pyrolysis or torrefactions to re get rid of moisture and other things, you add up increasing the calorific value. But if the intended use is just the incineration, there is no point of doing cal you know, torrefaction and incineration. But if your intended use is to convert into some carbon material, then doing pyrolysis and gas, you know, the torrefaction does improve calorific value. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Tiwari, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I just want to add, uh, again, uh, uh, even if Naman can't share the full process, a lot of questions are also around that. And you also asked that uh, once it is removed, what is happening? See, the toxicology studies also show that, yes, there are 7,000 chemicals, but because it is not concentrated, it is not as harmful. Once we start collecting it and pushing it for recycling, we are concentrating it. 
you know, even if at the point of recycling, we are treating them. Uh, what is happening to that water? What is happening? How are you managing your ETP, which will have this kind of, uh, you know, chemical load? It will be quite expensive to handle such uh, harmful chemicals in any kind of process. Similarly, when we are talking about bricketing, uh, you know, the moment you handle these toxic uh, products in facilities which do which we are, which are not well equipped or even monitored for their, uh, you know, emissions, whether water or air, I would recommend the benefit of reducing volume is not enough uh, to justify that harm such units can cause. It is better to just put them in a with minimum manual handling. You put them in a bag, just send it to cement factories, which are still better equipped to handle, uh, you know, pollutant load of this nature compared to any other uh, small scale industry. So we are, uh, as an organization, we are not for, uh, recycling, uh, you know, small setup recycling of any uh, uh, environmentally challenging uh, items, even many of the plastics, uh, you know, we are not for pelletizing small scale, having pelletization being done in small scale because of this reason, because these facilities are not well equipped to manage the air and uh, ETP uh, pollution that comes out from such facilities. So I would refrain from having any small scale infrastructure for handling material as toxic as this. So now in many cities, uh, Dr. Tiwari, there is a push to have waste to energy plants. Uh, Delhi has three and yes. some other cities are, I think we have around eight or nine working in India right now. Some are not working, but uh, now even in West Bengal, just uh, we had a meeting yesterday where uh, they are asking us to help with the waste to energy plant here as well. So it can go, as you're suggesting, to cement plant. It can go to waste to energy plant as well. Because also, they have... as an organization, we are not for waste to energy plant. Yeah. <laughs> Still, India has enough uh, capacity in its cement plants to take in the all the non-recyclable waste that a country generates. Problem uh, so is have... the distance, uh, Dr. Tiwari. Yes, like, for example, I in agree. From Bengal, so, Bengal, we we have we are sending our these waste to Odisha. So I if agree. you look at that transportation carbon footprint. It, uh, I agree. But the, what we have seen is the moment you have these waste to energy plant, the, the whole concept of reduce, reuse, recycling goes for a toss. You know, we have yeah, seen this across Europe, you know, best of countries, they segregate, but they end up burning 60% of it uh, because they have waste to energy plants. So that that is the fear. That is the fear, genuine fear. I agree. Like, uh, so yes, uh, Naman, we'll uh, come back to you on uh, if you can set some light on uh, how the ETP and other things are handled uh, in this, uh, uh, like in your facility or similar facility, and then uh, I'll add some other questions. So just to start with this one now. So uh, in our process, whatever water that we are using for recycling this polymer, we are recycling that water also and reusing the water after the recycling has been done for, for us. So the same water that we have used to, uh, let's say, recycle the batch number one. So once the batch number one of the fiber has been recycled, we recycle the water that has been contaminated during this process. And after the recycling of the water is complete, we reuse the same, uh, same water to treat the second batch of the fibers. So this way, uh, the same water is being used to recycle the further batches. So this way, we are able to solve the ATP problem, basically. But that will not go for in indefinite. You can do it maybe four rounds, five rounds, but it, at some point of time, your water will be dirty enough uh, to kind of, uh, otherwise your product will start losing its quality. You will start seeing more toxins in your products, isn't it? So at uh, some point, you have to treat that water. I'll explain you in a bit uh, elaborated form. Once the water is being recycled, it's still drinkable, but we it has a yellowish color. If, so you treat the water. The you mean that you treat the, the water? Is if it's yeah, drinkable, it's, yeah. So that's what. Uh, so yeah, you have we, an ATP. Uh, you have an ATP effluent treatment plant. Yes, we have a, the entire facility has that, and even if we want to change the color of the water to bring it to its transparent color, we can oxidize it. But oxidization will increase the pH value. I have a commerce background, but this is all scientific because I have seen that and I have been doing this practically. So that is why I have these answers ready for you, sir. And uh, coming to the toxins, even if the uh, toxins that are sedimented on the uh, 
bottom of the uh, water that is also majority of the chemicals are already neutralized neutralized during the recycling process that we have so the technology that we have it's uh, it's a bit confidential for us because that is the basically the usp that we have uh, developed to recycle this uh, hazardous material so that is why we are not very much uh, uh, open to disclose each and every component of the material but if somebody wants to implement this technology and utilize this technology like for example we are already working in other parts of the uh, world also not just in india so we have already provided this technology to four more countries so uh, if somebody wants to set up this technology we are open to discuss and uh, provide the technology as per the uh, legal agreements okay so uh... So in terms of uh, some, uh, like a, the question to which it has come for all panelists, which talks about that Dr. Sarma mentioned the recent research into more biodegradable filter material, and Dr. Tiwari flagged the need to have it. So which material holds the most promise in terms of uh, for the biodegradable, when you talk about biodegradable material, which material holds the most promise and how sustainable they are in terms of their toxicity, footprint, of the source material, filter capacity. Is there any uh, uh, information out there? So that looks like a PhD right there. <laughs> so, but, uh, but is there any information out there which you would like to share? Uh, there are initial studies, but then uh, they have used the food stars based solutions, even the cotton based, they have used it. Uh, but I think uh, since cellulose is uh, widely and very cheaply available, so because of that, they go because economic of scale makes sense. So because you are using a food-based trust, then you are also competing with the you know the food. So that is why they are doing. But then whether it is uh, as good as the cellulose-based in terms of porosity and the you know filtration uh, studies, what I have found is yes, it, it does. Uh, but uh, sustainability and economic value and acceptability uh, that is the question right now so there's a question on like let's say it's a labor intensive process like in terms of separating those but uh, so is the scope to mechanize the process so even somebody made a comment saying that it may work in a developing countries but what about developed countries where the labor is very costly will it be cost effective yeah the products and all so, Naman, do you want to? Yeah, I'll answer this. Uh, for separation, uh, we generally employ rural women because uh, there they don't have the adequate uh, opportunities to work, maybe because of the family barriers and geographical barriers, educational barriers. So this way we are able to empower them and give them livelihood opportunities. And whatever cost that we incur for separation, we absorb this cost internally so that... Uh, uh, the concept of recycling is not just to make money, basically. We are a planet before profit company. So even if we spend more towards uh, empowering these women and providing them livelihoods, then also the products that we are making, we are able to sell it at the competitive prices, the paper and the textile that we are making. If you are buying a normal yarn or a paper uh, that is available in the market, our product coming from recycled cigarette buds will also have a similar price. So then also because the volumes that we are achieving right now and the uh, amount of team that we have so far across India, so we are able to balance the economics and as well as uh, look for the uh, environmental impact and the social impact that we are, be, we are able to create through our uh, entire business model. So yes, right now it's uh, semi-automated, I can say. Some part can be uh, like, for example, some filters can be uh, separated by machine because there are multiple size brands, uh, conditions of the materials. Not every cigarette filter will have the same size because there are multiple brands. And the condition also may vary because some people stub it under their feet. Some don't smoke the entire cigarette. Some might get burnt. So there are a lot of permutation combinations that we'll have to develop. So uh, uh, separating all the cigarette buds and developing a specific machine to se uh, separate uh, the components of cigarette buds will take another one year for us to come up with the machine. But yes, that is doable. That's not a problem, actually. Yeah, Dr. Tiwari, since uh, you have worked on several waste management stream, uh, 
Uh, so I always wonder, wonder about, like worry about the logistics. See, we have, for example, when we talk about food waste to energy, now where the food waste is, where I should have set up the plant and where the energy will be used. So same concept goes to all the waste team, including in the signet waste. So in terms of where are the generation points? And now if I'm sent using the labor at some particular location to the transportation to that, and where is my product will end up? So like, how do you, like based on your experience of working in different waste stream, how do you see that part? Like not only for secret waste, but in general, uh, because many Logistics. plants suffer, yeah. Uh, yeah, so logistics is obviously the uh, biggest cost head in uh, any waste management process. Uh, cigarette, but as a category, I would say has some advantage that you can store it for long. Uh, mm. You can, you know, you don't have to, uh, unlike food waste, which you have to, you know, get into mm. processing, you know, in like, you know, matter of, uh, if not hours, definitely days. Yeah. Yeah. Cigarette, but uh, you can, uh, you know, store it and uh, like Naman was saying, even individual cigarette smokers, if they can have that bin, it is not a nuisance. You can store, I'm sure, 300 butts also in that bin and there'll be no smell. There is no nuisance. So from that angle, this category has an advantage that uh, it is not a nuisance to store. It is not voluminous. It doesn't stink. Uh, so that has this has an advantage. But my issues still remain with the uh, toxicity part of it. So definitely if Naman can share some insights into they have done uh, test reports of the effluent uh, treatment output, their product test reports, et cetera, from, uh, you know, uh, authorized labs, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in seeing those. Uh, and the inherent whether the product, because I check the websites, the, uh, the, the, like the paper cost is, quite high like you know the envelopes everything is like each envelope is you know like 60 rupees which as i said it goes into the luxury segment rather than uh, in the segment of common uh, customer affording these uh, products so those are some of my concerns but as a category as i said it has that advantage it can be stored uh, and should be collected from me. That is very important, separate collection from the angle of the toxicity of the product. Okay. Uh, uh, I like yeah, to uh, yeah. I like to ask one question here yeah. to Dr. Tiwari also to Professor Dube. Uh, since we are talking about uh, littering of the waste, okay, so we are collecting waste provided it is provided by the bulk generator from hotels and restaurants and the airports and other things. We have where we have provided bins. But the new generation, you know, the young smokers, you know, they are they do the coveted smoking, you know, and smoking is taboo, and they don't open do do the open smoking. Even the house, they cannot keep a bin. You keep a dustbin in the house, method, you get a beating from your father. You cannot do that, right? It's not acceptable, at least in here. So, how do we stop the littering? Is the question that I'd like to put it forward. Okay, we collect it, we do the valorization, recycling, incineration, fine, but then littering itself, how do we solve that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a pure behavioral issue, but you know, if yes. there is, if there is a, a valorization, it's if there is a real valorization in this product, uh, then you could have that every uh, 10 butts that you put in a bin, you get a coupon, you get a voucher that can reduce littering. If there is a genuine valorization uh, potential in the uh, product, in the, in the recycling value chain, that could be one way of doing it. Although we are not for uh, you know any such activities because we should discourage cigarette smoking itself. You know, so mm -hmm. producing, giving some incentive in return for people <laughs> to uh, start depositing but yeah. will get ethically questioned. So, but yeah, that, that 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 brings down the questions that whether we are solving the littering or smoking issue. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I would also say that, uh, that, you know, uh, and that's where, again, I said, re as I said, recycling, sometimes it ends up, uh, you know, making this whole habit not so bad. Uh, because we're saying now it is getting recycled, great products are being made, people think it's okay, you know, we, we can. So I feel we should keep harping on that how, how harmful this is. It is harmful for you, it is harmful for when it is littered also that aspect has to be uh, highlighted so that then 
helps in dedicated collection also in bins because you're saying when you litter it, it is very harmful. And it also doesn't uh, encourage smoking because it is saying it is very harmful. So I feel that's where the messaging should be, uh, that it is a very harmful, very toxic product. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, we can also start something like in a cigarette uh, you know, packet that they do mostly for the health related, you know, 90% of the package is covered that injury is to health. If they can ensure, you know, even the littering, it is injurious to environment, you know, something like that. Because as Naman said in the very early, that we have accepted cigarette littering. It's very common. We don't say bad to someone litter, you know. So we have to fight that issue also. Correct, correct. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are running out of time. So, but we'll take one last question uh, uh, from which was from late in America. Uh, it's a general kind of uh, thought uh, that it's uh, in Latin America, adequate waste management in general is a challenge. However, through companies or association, adequate management of certain type of waste is sought. Any recommendation from your experience? And it's open to all the three panelists. So basically, you can have your last word maybe uh, for a couple of minutes each. And then you say that uh, how to manage waste in general. And then uh, in especially from the developing countries perspective, based on your experience, if you have something to say. Right? Anything you want to add? Uh... Uh, yeah, so I think uh, waste in general that I would start with what, what I see around in my states here. So we are developing and that too in the Northeast you know, Himalayan states. Uh, everything trickle down to source segregation that we see here. And uh, when the waste is not too voluminous, you know, that means, you know, waste to energy doesn't give that scope, even in terms of economic of scale and other aspects. So what trickle downs is whether we are segregating the waste and putting value to a waste. When we do the source segregations, we put value to that waste. And when the waste, when we put the value to a waste, you are actually making a waste as a commodity. I think we have to work more on that aspect, that how we inculcate that, you know, that level of awareness in terms of individual generators right from the household. That is what we see. And in terms of domestic hazardous waste and other things, still, I think the information and the level of awareness has not trickled down to the, you know, rural household, especially when the e-commerce has trickled down to the ruralist of the place, information from the government is yet to reach there. Amazon can deliver in the remotest corner of Sikkim, remotest corner of the Sikkim, but the information from the government is yet to reach them. So that is what we are lacking. So I know, I think private players are more ahead of the government. So that is where we have to look at. Okay. So anything, uh, Dr. Tiwari, you want to add or Naman, uh, you want to, who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll, 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 yes, sure. I'll add points. Uh, so I, when I had joined Waste, I thought it was a simple behavioral issue. Uh, it's just so segregation, which is an issue. Yes, so segregation is uh, important. And from our experience, we have seen that is implementing it uh, in terms of sensitizing, sensitizing people is not the difficult part. It is It breaks down when the municipality itself is not asking people to segregate. When they continue to collect mixed waste, that is the issue. So now when I look back 10 years in Sahas, uh, whatever we have picked up, it will be, it is not just the individual getting sensitive about it. It is as community, we need to get sensitive about this issue. It's a collective responsibility. It's a, it's, you know, because waste is, you know, is, is a public problem. As an individual, you may not be able to do so much, but coming together as a community, and demanding your municipality to get its act together is what we feel will turn things around. And then as a community, you also need to respond to the best practices which are there. If the municipality is asking people to segregate and give their waste, you bribe the primary collector to collect mixed waste. We contribute to breaking down of the system. So we need to we need to first accept it's a genuine problem and which will hurt us today and generations to come. We need to uh, accept it, come together as a community, get the municipality to act on the demands that we have, and then behave responsibly. Is these are the things? These are big things. I agree, but a lot of our issues today, whether social or environmental, demand us to come uh, together as communities and be responsible so that is that is what i would say is the is the mandate 
to really solve this problem. So, Naman, last thoughts, last thoughts to you, and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> sure, sir. Thank you. Uh, in waste, as general, like it's a mindset that we have developed, and uh, in my experience, I have seen that humans are the only species that uh, create so much waste. Other species don't. Like uh, there was some signage or somewhere, like if you are in beaches or mountains, behave like animals. They don't litter. So this was a signage that goes very deep and has a very meaningful uh, dialogue, uh, I can say, that can trigger anybody's mind. So it actually boils down to the individual mindset. And Divya, Dr. Divya rightly mentioned that it's a collective responsibility. So it's not just my individual effort or her or yours. Uh, it's like we are all in it together. And if we want to solve the problem of waste, then we all have to work on it. It's not just that we as a team can do it or you as a team can do it. If everybody takes a little bit of action, like if they start consuming what they actually need instead of hoarding everything and buying uh, just for their own temporary satisfaction or motivation. So that also adds to a lot of waste problems. So similarly, if we are able to refuse, like for example, if I am in a group of 10 people out of whom nine are smoking, so one or two will ask that uh, want to have a smoke or not. So if I refuse, then I also add to the consumption reduction. So uh, the five hours, they actually have a meaning. We just keep it to the books and theories and just talk it on webinars. But if we start taking action, then the problem of waste can actually solve and create a better and a happy and even a greener society for everyone. So that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. We we actually went too far uh, more than what we are supposed to have. <laughs> that, that usually happens in most of the webinars so we are doing it. Uh, so again, thank to all the three of you. Now I hand over to uh, Akansha to like finally wrap up. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Much. Thank you, Professor Dubey. And thank you so much to the entire panel today for taking time out and uh, sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. Uh, we are glad we were able to capture some opinions and maximum voices as diverse as possible and contrary to each other uh, for this growing environmental concern. I would say even this one and a half hours is less for, uh, you know, discussing the cause the concern and the you know remedies or solutions to you know combat this particular uh, environmental uh, risk uh, or the letter that this particular uh, issue that we all are facing globally uh, thank you all the attendees for joining this webinar and being part of this informative session as i mentioned this webinar is being recorded and we will be available on uh, the be waste wise uh, website and youtube channel and if you would like to stay updated on our future events, then please do subscribe to our newsletter and also on uh, follow us on social media. I would request all the panelists to connect with all the attendees, whoever would want to have a personal introduction. I think all of you all can, uh, you know, connect with them on LinkedIn. They all are available and approach them. And if there are any queries that are still pending and you would want to raise it with the panel, then you can please share it with us and uh, we will make sure that they are being sent across to the panel today. Thank you so much for your time and lovely day ahead. And uh, we hope to see you all again for another Power Power Pact session uh, next month. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.